Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse Hicks. I'm the Vice President of Advancement for the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. I want to thank you again for being here with us today. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce Dr. Manunga to speak to innovations in vascular medicine and complex aortic conditions. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to say a few words about the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation and our wonderful partners. Um, we're an independent nonprofit research and education organization with over 80 staff members. Um, we partner with the world renowned physicians at the Minneapolis Heart Institute who lead and pursue research with our organization. And that research leads to global impact and improves CV care for our patients. Um, I want to say thank you to our partners. The Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Physician Group, along with Atlanta Health and Abbott Northwestern Hospital, um, they're great partners and we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do without those. So thank you for those uh, folks. Cardiovascular research and education is the reason that we're here. Uh, we were founded over 38 years ago with a mission to improve cardiovascular health through research and education. At any time, there's over 200 studies consistently underway with 2,200 research participants participating in those studies. Uh, we have expertise across all areas of cardiovascular health, and about half the work that we do is physician-initiated research, along with the other half being industry-sponsored trials uh, where we get a chance to evaluate new treatments. Um, education is at the core of what we do. Um, we have over 200 intern alumni. Um, educating the next generation of healthcare providers is something we're very proud of. Um, along with over 11,000 hours of professional community and student patient education, and then our publications, over 200 publications of the work uh, that our physician group does and the research that happens here. Our impact in cardiovascular research and education is significant. First in world, first in, hu first in human achievements um, happen here, and we're grateful for the work that happens through that research. Changing international protocols to provide life-saving care, and then again, the inspiration that we find through our, the eyes of our patients and those who are able to serve. Our work is only possible because of the philanthropic generosity of others. If you're one of our donors, I'd like to say thank you. Um, your generosity really allows us to be able to continue the work that we do, um, working towards finding uh, a world with heart health. And um, thank you for that. There's going to be some information at the end if you do want to participate and learn more about our organization and support. But thank you. We are grateful. With that said, uh, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Dr. Mananga. Um, he's a researcher with MHIF and a vascular and endovascular surgeon at MHI. Among his many achievements, he received an Excellence in Research Award in 2010 at UCLA Kern Medical Research Forum. In 2010, a Surgical Jeopardy winner at the Southern California Chapter of American College of Surgeons in Santa Barbara. In 2011, he received the Jack H. Block MD Surgical Resident of the Year at Kern Medical Center. In 2016, he was recognized as a top physician and a rising star by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Magazine. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mananga. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse, for the uh, privilege. And thank you all for following us uh, online. Uh, the talk uh, over the next 25 minutes will be on uh, advances that have been made in uh, vascular medicine and vascular surgery. Really, uh, if you think about it, we can't really talk about advances in vascular surgery if we don't know where we've come from. So this will be a small little journey through the world of vascular surgery. Vascular surgery is a new specialty. Um, only uh, a few uh, decades ago, it wasn't even a specialty. Vascular surgery was practiced by general surgeon and cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, again, my name is Jesse Manung. I'm one of the vascular surgeons here at Abbott Northwestern Minneapolis Heart Institute. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, what is the scope of practice of a vascular surgeon? Well, I, you know, once I was asked by my mom, what is it that you really do? And, and I struggled to tell her what I did, but uh, I came out with this thing and I think it's closest to the truth. I said, you know, mom, I fix every blood vessel in the body with the exception of the heart and the brain. That's essentially right there, gives you a definition of what the vascular surgeon does. And as a result, it's really difficult for me to talk to you about everything that a vascular surgeon does in 25 minutes because we fix disease throughout the body. Uh, because of this, though, I'd like to give you some update in vascular surgery and vascular medicine focusing on carotid disease and aortic disease. Within the aortic disease, I'll talk about aortic aneurysm, and I'll talk a little bit about acute aortic syndrome. What an acute aortic syndrome really is, is aortic dissection and uh, ruptured uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. 
When it comes to vascular disease, really the world of Benjamin Franklin rang, rang very true. An mm -hmm. ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And what, what do I mean by that? A lot of our patients, in fact, most of our patients, 99% of our patients will ever be, either be former smoker or current smoker, people who a lot of the times live kind of a sedentary life, a lifestyle. They have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, they've had, my, had myocardial infraction, they have diabetes. And, and modifying these risk factors, all these risk factors really, really important to curbing or treating vascular disease. The second thing about vascular surgery is that prevention, again, prevention is better than a cure. Because of that, we have to screen, screen, and screen. The reason why we're screening is because outcome of vascular treatment is actually better when it's done electively rather than done emergently. This means screening for carotid, uh, carotid disease, screening for aneurysmal disease, asking people if they, if they have any history or family history of, uh, of aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection. These are good patients that should, that should be screened. So let's talk a little about carotid disease. Carotid disease is probably the earliest disease the vascular surgeon started fixing in the, in the 1950s. Uh, when a person gets a carotid, carotid disease, as, as most of us know, it's located right at the carotid bifurcation. As you see, this is a healthy carotid artery on the right-hand side, and this is a plaque extending from the common carotid artery into the internal carotid artery. Eventually, this artery narrows and can cause a stroke. And uh, thankfully, in the Western world, especially in the United States, the majority of carotid disease are asymptomatic. So we start treating people with carotid disease if the narrowing of stenosis is greater than 70%. Uh, carotid disease can also be symptomatic, and there are three types of symptoms of patients with carotid disease. The first is called TIA, or transient ischemic attack. It's a, it's a minor stroke, so to speak. Um, so essentially, the patient gets symptoms similar to a stroke, but these symptoms don't last long. They last up to 24 hours or less than 24 hours. They might have weakness on one side of their body. They might have drooping on their face. They might have slurred speech. Sometimes it just lasts seconds and then it goes away. The other, uh, sim uh, the other symptoms of symptomatic credit disease is what we call amaurosis fujax. Well, amaurosis fujax is essentially like a stroke of the eye. The first branch of the internal carotid artery is called ophthalmic artery. It's the artery that goes up to supply the arm. You can imagine if a clot break off in an internal carotid artery, it can go either straight to the brain or can go to the eye. If it goes to the eye, the patient will say, Doc, I felt like a curtain was just being pulled down my eye for a minute. I couldn't see, and then I could see again. Sometimes it could be bilateral, but most of the time it's on both sides. And then there's always a, a stroke, of course, and we all know how devastating a condition this can be. Carotid disease, again, have been treated over time by a technique called a carotid endorectomy. This is a very well perfected technique and, and a very, very good surgeon, a, a very good surgery. You make a small incision in the neck, as you see right here. We clamp the artery above and below. We take all this plaque out and we close the artery. We used to be able to close the artery. We used to close the artery uh, without a patch. But what we found out that if you don't patch this artery right here over time, it narrows and the patient comes back with disease and you have to redo the surgery. So now we use the inner lining of a, a cow's heart, which is called bovine pericardial patch. We'll put all around here and suture all around to make this area bigger. And this is an outstanding surgery. However, because most of our patients are in the sixth, seventh, eighth, and sometimes a ninth decade of life. Um, putting the patients under general anesthesia is not that desirable. Not, not all patients will sur survive general anesthesia. And when endovascular therapy started gaining steam, carotid stenting was also thought of. And with the, the idea of carotid stent is that you puncture the groin, much like they do PCI or, or coronary stents. You, in, you go in with dye and a catheter, get into the aorta and get into the carotid artery, go with a wire past the area where the blockage is, and then put a stent. 
to take the blockage away. The problem with this uh, this uh, technique is that when you go up, you try to try to cross this lesion, you can actually break clot that go up to the brain. That alone causes stroke. So the rate of stroke is high. So a lot of people posed it. They said, you know, this is perhaps not the best way to go because the stroke is high. Well, they came up with something called an embolic protection device. And they said, what if we can put a, a filter up above where the lesion is and then, and then put a stent? Well, you're still going through the lesion before getting that. The filter itself can also cause a stent. So the breakthrough in carotid disease is actually the new procedure, which is called TCAR, which we performed here. Uh, our program is led by my partner, Dr. Jessica Titus, uh, that, uh, that leads this program. This is an outstanding operation. The idea here is that flow in the artery, we know that is higher than flow in the vein. So if we can make a small incision in the base of the neck where the artery is normal, Take a catheter, we don't go to where the, the lesion is, where the blockage is. We put a catheter here, and then we take a circuit that comes and get into the common femoral vein. And in the middle of the circuit, we have a filter that filter all the debris. Now we reverse flow. Uh, I'm sorry, we have to go back. We reverse flow coming from the brain going all the way down. So the debris is going further down and it's being captured by the basket without us ever passing anything above. And if we could do that, then we could put a stent and, and we won't get any, any rate of stroke. And this procedure is really a game changer. The rate of stroke of patients undergoing this procedure is about the same as a carotid endorectomy, where we control when we where we control the uh, the the carotid above and below, and it can be done under local anesthesia. So again, we're performing a lot of this this procedure here, MHI, uh, and we have outstanding results again under the, the guidance and leadership of Dr. Titus. I'd like now to. Uh, emphasize a little bit about aortic disease where I'll spend most of our time. Uh, aortic disease has daunted people for the longest time. The gentleman that you see on your right, right side of the, uh, of the, uh, the screen there is Dr. Uh, Sir William Osler. Dr. Osler, he has a few fun facts, was a very prominent Canadian surgeon. He was born in, uh, for, in 1849. He was one of the four professors that founded the institution that most of us know, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Uh, Osler had people traveling from Europe, United States, uh, all over the United States, Canada, China, everywhere in the world to just come and watch him operate. And Dr. Uh, Osler was famously knowing, uh, saying that there's no disease more conducive to clinical humility than aneurysm of the aorta. And this was really true because there was really, back then, if you got an aortic aneurysm, it was a death sentence. You're just gonna die. You wait until it ruptures and then you die. In fact, a lot of people don't know certainly a few facts about this gentleman that you know, everybody probably knows. This is Dr. Einstein. In 1948, Dr. Einstein actually started complaining of abdominal pain. He went out, out and sought the help of this renowned surgeon. This is Dr. Rudolf. Uh, Nissen. Dr. Nissen invented a procedure that we still use for acid reflux. It's called Nissen fund application. And Dr. Nissen diagnosed Dr. Einstein with intestinal cysts. And he took Dr. Einstein to the operating room and explored his belly. When he explored his belly, he found out that Dr. Einstein had an intact aortic aneurysm. Not knowing what to do and no cure at the time, it took, it took cellophane and wrapped Dr. Einstein aneurysm around. He lived for a little while. In, 19, in 1955, he started complaining of abdominal pain going to his back. He presented to the hospital in Princeton and was diagnosed with an abdominal aortic aneurysm that had burst. And right about the same time, Dr. Einstein was actually offered him a repair a, an experimental repair. As smart as he was, I said, you know what, this thing's experimental. I don't want to have it, uh, the, this operation. And he died at age 76 of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. 
What was that repair? Well, there are two dates when it comes to aortic aneurysm that I want us to remember. The first is 1951, and the second is 1954. In 1951, these two gentlemen by the name of uh, Michael DeBakey and Dr. Cooley out of Houston fixed the first six in the world the abdominal aortic aneurysm. They went, they presented in the Southern Association of Vascular Surgeons uh, their results. And the Everybody received it positively because people were, had been daunted by this disease. And they said, you know what? This is a game changer. What they used there, they used cadaveric uh, aorta of the cadavers to replace people uh, aortic aneurysm. In 1954, Dr. Cooley was the very first one to fix a person with a ruptured aortic aneurysm. What you see here, this is an aneurysm. It burst and the patient was leaking. God in his infinite wisdom gave us six liters of blood in us. If the aneurysm ruptures like this, it might go one, two, three, and you're done. Uh, you just ex essentially exsanguinate, you bleed. Dr. Cooley was able to fix what a person in 1954 uh, with a cadaveric aorta that you see here, an operation that was exactly like this. So this is the head over here, these are kidney arteries. This is the cadaver aorta of, from a cadaver, and this is branching into the iliac arteries. The patient lived for five days, but died from multi-organ uh, failure because he had to clamp above the kidney artery and the clamp, clamp time was too long. Dr. DeBakey started thinking, uh, how can I ever really, we don't have enough cadavers that are donating the aorta. We have a lot of patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm. He went home and he saw his wife sewing uh, clothes and they had a brilliant idea. Is what if I take this polyester fabric called Dicron and start making the aorta of the patient? And he borrowed the, the, the sewing machine from his wife and he made the first Dicron. Fast forward a few years later, the industry caught wind of it. What the picture that you see there is a patient, a 76-year-old patient of mine that we fixed, we fixed with a thoracal abdominal aortic aneurysm. I'm sorry. The aneurysm that essentially started in the chest, just distal to the subclavian artery, came all the way below the, below the kidney artery. So what you see here is the, the aorta. This is the, the same uh, woven graft that Dr. DeBakey designed. Uh, that we have used here. And we've taken this graft here uh, that's going to the celiac axis or the artery that supplies the brain, I'm sorry, uh, supply the liver, the artery that supplies the, sp uh, the spleen, uh, the artery that supplies the bowel, the, kid the right kidney and the, the left kidney. kidney. And we've replaced everything. Here, we had to cut a few ribs. You, we have rotated everything from the left side of the patient to the right side. The lung is over on the right. The bowel is over on the right. The kidneys and everything is on the right side. As you can imagine, because this disease is a disease of older people, people really, this is really, really hard surgery on the patient. Patient go to rehab. A lot of the patient tells me it takes me the minimum six months before I can feel the way I was feeling. Well, here came another gentleman by the name of Juan Carlos Perotti. Dr. Perotti in 1991 said, what if I can use the same material that Michael DeBakey used, puncture the groin, go up, and then put a sleeve in an aneurysm. So instead of opening the patient up, essentially put a sleeve right here. From here all the way down, essentially that bypasses everything. So this now becomes the new aneurysm of a patient, and he did it. He treated six patients and he publishes results. He sent them to our most prominent journal, Journal of Vascular Surgery, but smart people as they were, everybody refused it. That this, the study was uh, rejected. He sent it to a few other journals, everybody rejected. People th thought, uh, called him a, a revolutionary and it, they refused it. He finally fi sent the, the journal to the Annals of Vascular Surgery of note, one of my, my former boss, Dr. Tim Sullivan, was actually the editor, is the editor of the Annals of Vascular Surgery, and this paper was published in the Annals of Vascular Surgery in 1991. Uh, fast forward 10 years later, this is a study that's now dated. In, 19, in 2008, the majority of aneurysm in the United States were fixed using Dr. Perotti's technique rather than an open technique. And if you look in the history of any disease, endovascular intervention or endovascular abdominal aortic intervention is lower mortality from aortic aneurysm disease more than any other disease in the history of medicine. So in 1999, for instance, 
if you walked in the hospital with an aneurysm or disease, I'll tell you your chance of dying is about 4.4%. However, in 2008, this risk was significantly down to 2.8%. And today in our practice, the chances that you will die from an aortic aneurysm going through the groin is 0.5%. Imagine that. Patient come in today, they get the, uh, the operation done. They don't even go to the ICU. It, by the afternoon, they're sitting, they're eating. The next day in the morning, by noon, they've gone home. And what a revolutionary thing. And a lot of smart people just say no. So then the idea was, well, can we take this thing, the uh, endovascular aortic aneurysm, apply it to other things, not only aneurysm disease, but trauma of the aorta, aortic dissection, penetrating aortic ulcer, or intramural hematoma? Well, we could. The problem is the invention by Dr. Perotti was a tube graph that only fixed aneurysm where you did not have these branch arteries. So we could not put it here because if we put this artery right at this stent right here, the patient's kidney will fail because the kidney all of a sudden have no blood flow. Um, so then people start thinking about it. Well, some people out in, in, in Australia by the name of Dr. Brown and Dr. Or Dr. Harley took the same graph that Dr. Perotti thought about that Dr. DeBakey had invented in the 1950, and they put a hole in it, saying, okay, we think that the kidney artery will come out here. So let's put a hole, let's introduce it in, 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 in animals, and they were lining it per perfectly by using a CAT scan. And these animals were surviving, and the arteries were still being perfused. And, but it was only in animals. It wasn't until 1998 that a gentleman by Dr. Anderson, also in Australia, performed the very first, what we call today, fenestrated stand graph, hence the birth of complex aortic aneurysm. Dr. Anderson, uh, this is actually the actual angiogram of the patient that Dr. Anderson treated. The, left, the right kidney artery was higher than the left kidney artery. He placed a single fenestration and the patient survived. Fast forward there, in the early 2000s, there were two people in the United States, one by the name of, the name of Timothy Schroeder out of the University of San Francisco, uh, University of California, San Francisco, and one, one by the name of uh, uh, Roy Grimberg at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Grimberg is today dead, who actually pushed the envelope. And going forward, the industry caught wind of it. Multiple clinical trials, all of them, either do we use fenestration or do we use branches? Multiple trials are taking place. Today in the United States, we have only one device. This here is called Cook Fenestrated Stand Graph that's approved for use, uh, for, uh, for use uh, clinical use by physicians. We have a number of devices undergoing clinical trials. Some of them have failed, so the FDA has debanded them. Here, this is a, co a, a Cook P branch. The Cook P branch is a, a device that, that's undergoing trial today to be used off the shelf, meaning if a patient comes in with an aneurysm that is already ruptured, we can actually pull it out and use it. We at the MHI were on the, only one of the two centers in Minnesota, the other being at the Mayo Clinic who participated in this trial. All the patients that, that we treated with this trial did extremely well. This trial is now closed. It's going, the results are outstanding. It's going back to the FDA, and the FDA, I'm, I'm assuming, will approve it uh, soon, and the device will be available to the general public. This, uh, what you see here is the Cook T-Branch and the Tambe device. Uh, MHI uh, currently is also one of the only two centers in Minnesota with access to this device. This, this device fix thoracal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Again, we're a site with a, uh, undergoing the trial, uh, uh, participating in this trial, and we're very excited, and I'll show you the application of this device. We have, we've also been approached uh, because of our excellence with uh, what we've been able to, to do with fenestrated stand graph and our participation in other trials. We've been approached by Cook for a, a, what, what's called Cook Zfen Plus. What it is, you can make up to uh, five different fenestrations or branches and will be one of the two, trial, two centers, again, in Minnesota participating in this trial. 
Well, what are we able to do? Well, here's a 75-year-old male who came in who had an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm mm -hmm. repair. If you see, now he has a what we call a thoracal abdominal aortic aneurysm mm -hmm. that's starting right above the uh, just distal to the subclavian artery in the chest. It's coming down. You see that below the kidney arteries, aneurysm has been fixed. Over what you see on the right side, this is this has already been uh, coiled. Uh, this gentleman was fixed with fenestrated stent graft, as you see on your screen there. We are able to get into all the vessels. This is completion angiography. We lined his entire aorta from the chest all the way down to the abdomen uh, with a fenestrated with a fenestrated stent graft. And this is the angiogram that we did afterwards. You can see the aneurysm is completely excluded. The patient went home after three days in the hospital versus going to rehab, and he was able to, 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 to participate in, it, in, this, in this family activity. You can see all the arteries, celiac, SMA, uh, right and left renal artery completely white, widely patent. That the convalescence period is extremely outstanding with these operations. Uh, it cuts out all of the, some patients will go to a rehab facility, however, the majority can, uh, will go straight home after this type of operation. Uh, if that type of technology was not available here at MHI, this would have been what we would have offered a patient. And the age 75, as you can imagine, patient would not do well uh, with this operation. So we have shown advantages of, of, uh, of endovascular repair. Surely uh, any repair that you do can fail. Fenestrated stain graft or infrarenal stain graft can fail, meaning that the aorta can continue to grow as long as the patient lives. This is the case of the 78-year-old male that we actually fixed not that long ago. Uh, he was underwent a repair here at our institution uh, a little while back with an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. So the stent, again, that was placed there is below the kidney arteries, but as you can see now, the aneurysm is bigger, is extending above the renal arteries. So in someone like this who has a failed uh, EVAR or the, the, the stent has failed, we can also convert them. And we're again, we are one of the only two centers in Minnesota uh, other than the Mayo Clinic during this type of operation where we can salvage a patient who has had a previous failure repair. We fix them with a fenestrated stain graft. You can see the celiac artery open uh, uh, by this uh, scan. SMA is widely open. The right and the left renal artery is open. Uh, you can see that the stent sleeve went inside another sleeve. The aneurysm is completely excluded. Patient was discharged home on post-operative day number three. Um, there are area of intense, ex, uh, intense research, and that includes ascending aorta. Can we fix the ascending aorta all the way up here? And we'll talk about, about that, the aortic arch, and also thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm and iliac artery aneurysm. The device is not there yet, but we, we, are, we do have some ways here at MHI that we're treating these patients. This is another 78-year-old male that came in with difficulty, difficulty sw uh, swallowing. And then at the same time, he was also so having chest pain. He was scoped. He was found out that one of the nerve, a recurrent laryngeal nerve, was not working properly. His vocal cord was not walk working properly. He had a CT scan that showed a big aneurysm. He was not a good candidate for an open repair. For this gentleman, we designed a graph in the operating room ourselves. Uh, as you can see, that his aneurysm was starting right here at this uh, subclavian artery. We had to land the device here. So if we put a stent right here without a hole, it will cover the patient will not have blood flow in the back of the left side of the brain and also in the left arm. As a result, we designed this, to the, this device in our operating room to accommodate him. And here we are in the operating room. We've gone in with a needle poke. I'm sorry. Uh, we've gone in with a needle poke over the right groin. We come with a wire through and through the groin. We come uh, with another wire from the arm. And we've gotten this wire through and through from the groin to the arm. We, uh, we've advanced the device. And we made sure the hole lines up. And when it lined up, we went ahead and uh, treated this patient over what you see over on the left side is uh, the picture or the angiogram that we did before. 
and this is a CAT scan afterwards, you see that the aneurysm mm -hmm. is excluded. Uh, and this is all done with just a small needle poke in the groins and a small incision in the arm. So again, we talked about the spectrum of the disease, trauma, and dissection. What can we do with, uh, with dissection? I'd like to talk a little bit about dissection over the next two, uh, maybe two minutes. Dissections, as we know, is classified as uh, type A dissection or type B aortic dissection. Type A dissection in an emergency and demand uh, an open repair. Type B aortic dissection traditionally being uh, fixed with uh, med uh, medical management with antihypertensive medication. These are the risk factors of aortic dissection. We won't go over them for time's sake. A lot of genetic predisposition, that's why it's important for primary care physicians to, to screen patients with Marfan syndrome, Loris Deed syndrome, uh, familiar aortic dissection syndrome, or ehlers Danlos syndrome. These are all syndromes that predispose people to having aortic dissection. Again, management for top aortic dissection is, is uh, open repair. Here in MHI, cardiothoracic surgery and, car and vascular surgery and cardio cardiology, all of us are working together to fix these patients. And so maybe someday you can either invite uh, Dr. H Kevin Harris or myself. Uh, uh, we can talk a little more about what we're doing. Uh, type B aortic dissection is being fixed with anti-impulse therapy. Uh, the reason why type A is fixed with uh, medical therapy is because really people don't do that well. Mortality is north of 50%, uh, close to 60% if you leave a type A aortic dissection alone. Um, but if you fix them, fix them with surgery, it's about 20%. It, type B aortic dissection, if fixed with surgery, is very high. It used to be very high, about 30%. Uh, this is open surgery. Uh, it was about uh, a little north of 10% medically managed. However, we're, not, we're now opening, uh, we're no longer opening people with type B aortic dissection like the gentleman you see here. This is a 67 year old, a patient of mine that I had fixed uh, early on when I started here, came in. I was flown from uh, uh, North Dakota where a patient, uh, a physician there was trying to fix mesenteric ischemia and the wire caused a dissection as you see there. So I went ahead and stented the gentleman. Six months later, you see that his aorta is completely remodel because of the stent that we place. So what is aortic dissection? This is a media that we won't play for, for you today uh, for time's sake. But essentially, uh, imagine as the aorta is beating, so courtesy of Dr. Kakatera, all of a sudden you can have a, a tear uh, into one of the layers of your aorta. Essentially, the aorta tears up. Instead of having one channel uh, taking the blood down, now you have two different channels that will be taking the blood, uh, blood into the leg. So the, why are we worried about it? Well, this can progress and becomes an aneurysm and if you rupture, the patient dies. But we put a stent. This is the exact same, same thing that happened uh, 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 in, uh, that happens with the aneurysm. This is exactly the way we, we fix the, the uh, the last gentleman that you see there. Um, again, for time's sake, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and progress. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll progress with that. So we are not fixing, um, we're not advocating to fix all type B aortic dissection. We break every aortic dissection into high risk and low risk patients. High risk patients have certain characteristic on CAT scan. Low risk patients, we're following them very, very closely. We're working together again with cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, and vascular surgery. Uh, big kudo to Dr. Kevin Harris, who's worked very tirelessly for our aortic dissection. And I'd like to stop here I'm a little over my time. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Happy to take care of any questions. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Manungo. We really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise. Uh, if you could just advance a slide, just one more slide. Um, on the screen, you should see a Zoom Q&A walkthrough. Uh, attendees, I know quite a few of you are familiar with Zoom these days, but in case you haven't, ask a question through Zoom. Uh, the instructions are on your screen. Basically, what you're going to do is drag your cursor to the bottom of the screen uh, to access the toolbar or the control bar. And within that control bar, you should see an icon that says Q&A. Uh, and as Dr. Manunga said, uh, we'd like to open it up for Q&A at this point. And it looks like there are quite a few questions in the Q&A pod. So Dr. Manunga, if you are ready, uh, the first question 
is do you see many young patients with vascular disease, say under 50? Uh, yes, we do. Um, again, I, I've only talked about three, dis three uh, of the many, many diseases that we fix. Uh, we do see a big number of patients with, uh, with aortic dissection, especially type A aortic dissection is more common in young people. Uh, uh, you could be in your 50s, you have high blood pressure, or you have a family history of uh, aortic disease or aortic dissection. Uh, that's that's a, a, a big number of our patients. More and more patients are getting vascular disease because of smoking. Again, smoking is literally the number one cause of vascular disease. And the disease that usually affects people in their 60, late 60s and 70s is showing itself early in patients, um, uh, in, uh, early in, uh, in patients because of smoking. The other reason why young patients will get, will get vascular disease is uncontrolled diabetes. They might have a history of diabetes. They're not taking care of the, managing their blood sugar. Their hemoglobin A1C is high. They'll come in with wounds in their legs. Their vessels are heavily calcified because of diabetes, or they'll be in renal failure. Then we have to do a fistula um, uh, uh, for those patients. But it's really the vascular disease is not sparing uh, uh, anybody these days because of those risk factors. We also treat vein uh, uh, or venous disease, uh, which is more, more common, uh, more common in, in, in younger people compared to arterial disease. Excellent, thank you for your insight. Uh, the next question comes from Jessica, and she's wondering, what's the difference between an aortic dissection and a resection? Okay, uh, so, so aortic dissection, like that video showed you, so the aorta, think of it as a, as a garden hose that has three layers. The innermost layer is called the intima, meaning the intimate, that layer is an intimate connection with blood. The middle layer is called the media or middle, so it has, it's made of smooth muscle. The outer layer is called the adventitia, so the, or, or, uh, the strongest layer of the aorta. What an aortic dissection is, essentially a tear uh, inside the inner layer and the, the middle layer, so that the inner layer and the middle layer are separated to the outer layer. Now, instead of having one chamber, you have two chambers. This dissection can stop either way. It can come down, it can start at the heart and come down and stop for some reason, given uh, due to some dynamic uh, 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 situations um, that we might not know, we might not be able to explain. If we go ahead, we fix this patient piecemeal, uh, we fix part of the, the dissection, or, or, or if the patient go, goes on to be treated with medication alone, this dissection can progress over time. So that's, that's probably what you're referring to as a re-dissection. So once an aorta is dissected, that aorta, unless it's fixed, it becomes vulnerable to further aneurysm or degeneration or what we call disease progression, where the, the, end, the dissection either goes towards the heart or come down towards the leg. So that's, that's actually, it starts as a dissection, but it can progress if the risk factors are modified. What are those risk factors? Lowering blood pressure to less than 120 systolic. Lowering the diastolic blood pressure less than 80. Lowering the heart rate to less than 100, uh, what we call the anti-impulse therapy. Uh, Avoid straining, avoid lifting too many heavy objects once, once you have a dissection. Very important that you get connected with a system that sees a lot of these patients and that you're not lost in the crack and they can, they can educate you. You get genetic testing if, to see if you're predisposed to this disease and if you can pass it on to your children so you can educate, start educating your children. Uh, uh, to modify the risk for the future. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, the next question uh, from an attendee is, are former smokers who haven't smoked in 30 years still at higher risk for vascular disease? Yes, uh, so that's a very, very good question. Uh, quitting smoking is extremely important. So if I ever were to give you five different medications, just on the right, on the left hand side, and then quitting smoking, and say, Doc, I can only take one or the other. I'll tell you, number one, I say, please take, choose both. But if you can, quit smoking. 
So the fact that you quit smoking is a very, very good, a very, very good thing. The, 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 what happens with smoking is that it, it causes a lot of reaction in your body where plaque starts building up in different arterial bed in your, in your, in your body. The, the, the time you stop smoking, you're no longer accumulating plaque. Uh, what you are doing, actually, your plaque becomes stabilized, especially when medications like statin or cholesterol medicine. Uh, blood pressure medications are added on top of you quitting smoking and you start engaging in exercise. Surely you would have been a lot worse off if you hadn't quit smoking 30 years ago than you are today. Uh, some of the effects of smoking, uh, smoking can be reversed, but no 100% uh, reversible. But smoking cessation coupled with medications can mitigate a lot of the risks the smoke, uh, smoking actually uh, place on patients long term. Yeah, thank you for that. That makes a ton of sense and definitely a good, good habit to break. Um, uh, the next couple questions, it seems like there's quite a few questions sure. related to COVID-19, but I think they're all sure. asking sure. basically the same thing, and that's, are patients with vascular conditions having more challenges with COVID-19? Uh, and if so, do you have any suggestions for this sure. population? Um, so the, you know, the, the, the ch we don't, let me answer it this way. We don't know if they're having more challenges. Uh, and, and we are learning. We're learning about COVID. Uh, what we know about COVID, I actually, now, now that this question came about, I should have included. Uh, we recently, Dr. Nita Skeek, uh, uh, Dr. Merz and myself, uh, but with little with the, the leadership of Dr. Skeek, we published in a journal of vascular surgery uh, the approach to management of vascular disease or venous disease in COVID patients. What we're finding is that a lot of COVID patients are getting blood clots, a lot of them, and a lot of them are getting stroke. And that, what Dr. Uh, Skake outlined in that article, maybe we'll, I don't know if there's a way to link it, uh, we might link it to, to this talk later on, to, or we can reference, it's an open access uh, uh, article, you can go on, under the Journal of Vascular Surgery, look at the, my, own, my name or Dr. Skate's name, you will see, it has a complete breakdown how here at MHI, we are treating people with vascular patients with COVID that have blood clots. So. That's the biggest thing, uh, blood thinners. How is COVID affecting vascular disease? Well, it delayed care in some patients. We're seeing more and more patients that we should, we, we normally would have treated earlier, but because we did not want to expose the patients and we didn't have PPI, uh, uh, P, uh, PPE rather, uh, we, uh, uh, or the hospital was in the process of getting PPE. We delayed certain surgeries. So I think the effect of that will be seen, but um, I think this chapter is not being fully written yet. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Looks like we have a few questions left. I think for the sake of time, we should go through two or three more. Sure. Um, so the next question is, how can people generally just stay up to date on current research in your field of expertise, so vascular surgery in general or specifically aortic disease or yeah. something along those yeah. lines? I, I, that's a very, very good question. So the, um, there are a few journals for vascular surgery, uh, Journal of Vascular Surgery, um, uh, Journal of Vascular Therapy, and Annals of Vascular Surgery, obviously. But th th these, are, these are not easy to understand unless you're a vascular surgeon. So this, this is why really the mission of MHI is so important. What's been done here is very important. I try to break the stock. Uh, I'm sure it's still very complicated, but I try to break it that so a doctor understand it so that also a person who's not a physician can understand. I think the honest is on us to put a lot of these series online so that people can go in there and click, hey, how do I, how do I get access to this? And, and you can go to uh, MHIF, to our, 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 uh, our website. I'm sure you'll see a series of different talks that have been given about vascular surgery. You can click on that. It's by watching that. Uh, short of that is really by, by going to, uh, to the journals, uh, uh, our website, uh, the journal website, and getting articles about this. Uh, the only thing about it is it's very difficult to understand a, an article written by vascular surgeons unless you're another physician and, and, and even then you're a physician who 
who's more versed into cardiovascular disease. So talks like this make a, a big impact in my, in, my, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. We thank you for, for joining us today. I think this is a good question to end off on, um, but what are you most hopeful for or excited about uh, with the future of vascular surgery? Yeah. I, I, am, I have never been more excited. This is actually the reason why I joined this. I think the time is coming when every single disease that we will be able to replace the entire aorta from the heart all the way down to the femoral artery with just a needle poke. The time is coming. Research is there, and this is very exciting. It's exciting for several reasons. Um, the, re the, the number one reason is because really surgery, if you think about it, opening the patient's heart now, there's some patient who still need open surgery because our patients are so old that their life is never the same after you do that big open chest surgery, the big open abdomen sur abdominal surgery. But if you can minimally invasively go in much like a coronary stents have made a difference, go through the, through the femoral artery and come up and you are able to replace everything, that will really make a big difference. I can tell you today there are companies working on devices that will, what, that will have uh, orifices in the coronary arteries that will start right here at the heart and that will come all the way down to replacing every single vessel. What this entails? This entails that cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, and vascular surgery are going to become so much more working together, more, more so than ever, which is genius what MHI was able to, to think of decades ago, 30 years ago, right? I mean, can you see the four sides of this? Bring in three different specialty at the same place. And, and, and this was at the time where these stance graphs weren't available. Nobody ever thought that we could ever work together, but boy, do we ever need each other. These cases will be need, done, I think, in the future. I, I see a future of cardiovascular disease where a cardiologist in, is in a room, a vascular surgeon is in a room, and a cardiothoracic surgeon is in a room. All of us working together to uh, take care of a patient. And when we work together, there's really nothing that can stop us. And that's, that's what excites me. Yeah, excellent. Very well said. Um, before we bring uh, Jesse Hicks back up, Dr. Manunga, do you have anything that you'd like to say to our audience today? Uh, thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And we always available here. Uh, you can, uh, if you think there's a patient, as we, we don't think there's, a, there's a, a stupid question. If you have any questions, you can always contact us. You can contact a Department of Vascular Surgery here. Our phone number is 612 863 Six eight zero zero. That's again six one two eight six three six eight zero zero. You get one of our outstanding coordinators, and they'll pass your question to one of our physicians. We have a, a very well trained, talented group of surgeons that take very good care of patients, and one of us will get back to you with any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you again, Dr. Mononga, for a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, many of you, again, I think hopefully you've seen this before, we want to ask you to stay connected. Um, our website's here, MinneapolisHeart.org, um, and there's a donate tab there if you want to make a difference in the work that happens here in the research. Uh, social media with Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all those, we're uh, connected as well. Um, and then our email if you have any questions, and we'd love to uh, address those. Thank you for joining us today and uh, look forward to having um, our next series start very soon. Have a great day.